Hello, everyone, and welcome to Unite Talks, our webinar series on business and technology. For those of you who are new to the series, we are Unite, a Swiss analytics, data, and AI company driving the adoption of data science in the industry and committing to sharing our best practices. My name is Billy, and I will be your host for today. However, for this special edition, we'll have Marcin moderating the panel discussion. We're live on LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. So feel free to ask all your questions on the platform that you're using. And also, if you appreciate the topic, feel free to comment plus one so we know that we can dive deeper on the topic. This session is recorded and will be available on our website, minute.com, in a few days. Without further delay, let's enter the topic. Marcin, the floor is yours. Welcome. My name is Marcin. I'm founder and CEO of Unitate, and I will have pleasure to moderate this session. Uh, we'll be discussing emerging technology trends in advanced analytics for 2022 and plus. And the discussion will be held with exceptional group of industry leaders and experts. Um, so please join me and welcome our panel. So Dr. Luca Baldessare, who is lead data scientist in Swiss Re, Advanced Analytics Center of Expertise. And before Swiss Re, Luca worked among the others in Gamaya, startup using satellite imagery uh, for agriculture. Luca holds PhD in machine learning from University of uh, Genoa. We have also with us Tanvi Singh, Head of Analytics and Data Science at Credit Suisse, CCRO, which stands for Chief Compliance and Risk Office, uh, where she leads a large team of experts across Zurich, New York, and Singapore. Tanvi has 20 plus years of experience in data analytics, especially in the context of regulatory tech. She holds master's degree in the University of Zurich, completed with executive education at Stanford. Please also welcome Valid Mehana, Group Data Officer at Merck Group, uh, where he is leading Merck Data Office. His passion is to leverage data to improve efficiency and effectiveness of organizations. With 25 years uh, hands-on with technology, Valid always works at the intersection of business and tech. And he holds Master of Science in Computer Science uh, from Karl van Ossietsky University. We have also participants from Unitate, Miha Raftan, our founder and Unitate CTO, formerly tech lead in Palantir Technologies. He worked on mission critical intensive applications, data intensive applications across Europe and US in industries like aerospace, airlines, advertising, chemical, telecom, and investment banking. And Miha holds master of science degree from University of Science and Technology from Krakow. We have also with us Dr. Julian Herzen, who is our ARIA director and data scientist in Unitate. He is computer scientist and machine learning expert, expert with experience varying from research to leading data science project in industry. Julian holds PhD from EPFL. So this is really impressive group. Uh, I, I'm really, really glad to have uh, all of you with us. Uh, and I think we should just get started. So. First trend we want to discuss is about what we call mega models. So open AI in 2020 launched so-called GPT-3, which is a language model with 175 billion parameters. So this was largest artificial neural network at its time. System uh, is able to answer questions, write essays, even write small programs, which I think sent chills throughout uh, Silicon Valley at the time of launching GPT-3. Uh, and if you think this is large, well, Microsoft and NVIDIA just launched Megatron Turing language model with one trillion parameters. And to give you a feel of a scale, GPUs used to train those cost more than 85 million US dollars. And we see similar models being developed in other domains than language, computer vision, audio, forecasting, uh, and a number of others. So I think we are really witnessing a race for biggest, most powerful AI models. So here is question to you. Are those models really a game changer? Like Julian, what are your views on this topic? 
Um, yeah, I think to some extent they are. Uh, I think they are also a continuation of you know the deep learning revolution that started uh, almost 10 years ago now. And what we're seeing with these mega models, uh, I think that is also quite surprising for many folks, even in the machine learning community, is that uh, scale, you know, so more data and bigger models keeps just making things better, you know? <laughs> so there was this transformer architecture released in 2017 by Google, and it's just a type of neural networks that allows to, uh, you know, ingest, uh, among other things, it allows to in ingest uh, much more data, be trained on larger data sets. And in turn, uh, that creates the needs to, you know, uh, enlarge the models themselves and makes, make them always bigger, which makes them better. So I think it's a big deal. It unlocks new applications. Like you said, uh, you know, they can generate text. It can seem a bit abstract to generate text, but it has concrete applications. Uh, you know, we can think of uh, making current applications better, but also new things. So, for instance, virtual assistants, you can ask, I don't know, uh, what if Bill Gates was my personal assistant? You know, maybe the model can mimic Bill Gates for you, uh, recommending books or something. Uh, also, it can write code. Uh, it will have lots of applications, I think. And uh, it raises a few interesting questions. Those models are so huge that they are typically trained by a handful of players only because it costs you know millions and millions of dollars to train um, so on on the one hand it becomes more centralized but on the other hand uh, there is also some amount of democratization going on because now anyone with uh, you know access to the api can use them so more i think actually actors can also build applications on top of those models even though it's more centralized so there are, there are new trade offs emerging also, the job of machine learning engineering is changing. Um, you know, when you're a user of those models, as an engineer, you don't train the model yourself. This is kind of over. Uh, rather, you do these zero-shot learning, so you have to, you know, become skilled at coming up with the right prompts um, and, uh, you know, calling the APIs and so on. So it, it changes a bit the nature of the job. So, yeah, I think it's a big deal, and it's here to stay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for, for the insight, Julian. Uh, and Valid, perhaps you, you could shed a light on, on the topic a little bit from industry perspective. Maybe just a personal opinion. So um, I find it very impressive what GPT-3 and the other transformer models can, can do. And it's definitely a feat. But a lot of it is, let's say, to a good degree, brute force. And when looking from a business perspective, the question is, um, what business value, what business impact do we generate? Are we just showcasing what is possible? Or are we really generating a piece of technology that is leveraged to a greater good or that is used for, for real life impact? And this is something what I'm still missing a bit. One of the, one of the biggest issues with mega models that are pre-trained in my personal opinion is the whole topic of fairness uh, and responsibility and inclusiveness. So if you look for GPT-3, for example, there is this famous example. If you let it complete a joke, a Muslim walks into a bar, then over 60% of the results have something to do with violence. Mm. If you say a Christian walks into a bar, that is below 20%. Or I believe it's, it's about 30, 40%. But you see the problem with large mega models is you cannot control to a certain degree the output or you will have to put extra checks in place to essentially mitigate for the thing that you cannot do quality control in the input. So there is, let's say, a trade-off between risk and control that you have with leveraging mega models. If you want to build mega models, well, honestly, most, most of the industry players won't do that. But we do have some, some compute-hungry applications like computational chemistry and computational biology. And um, also one of the reasons why we are not operating 100% in the cloud, but also have on-premise uh, high-performance clusters still in place. So essentially, we're having a very keen eye. So there um, is maybe a sweet spot where you can either, let's say, leverage, reuse, or rebuild certain models in an HPC environment. That makes sense. But essentially, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting and very dynamic field a bit early on. So we're always having a keen eye 
but always with a with a try to have a val very balanced business perspective on it because just blindly applying it as we've seen from that um the joke example is always a bit of a business risk as well great great insight so uh, yeah you're bringing up the point of fairness uh, but also of the business value that's true that lots of those tools at the minute are uh, very nice toy examples uh, i would be curious perhaps uh, luca what, what's your perspective in in the world of insurance uh, are those mega models a topic for you well thanks and uh, my ideas evolved uh, in similar lines as uh, valid i think it's there's a problem of control you know, of really controlling and really being sure about the output of these models because you're you know, they're, they're great for generating text and more creative endeavors, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't use those models for mission-critical uh, uh, tasks because we, we need to really to have uh, some quality control. Where are we starting exploring these models? It's more kind of uh, in software tasks, kind of maybe chatbots, uh, customer assistance, uh, or uh, uh, helping uh, our people kind of get the, kind of through search, for example, kind of improving search functionalities uh, within the enterprise to find the right documents and uh, quickly getting summaries or interpreting what's in these documents. But uh, at the end, there's always a human in the loop, exactly for the reason that Valid mentioned, because we, you know, we, in a way, they, they learn a lot of things out of all these massive data amounts, but we don't, we're not really sure exactly what they have learned and uh, for which specific task they're optimal. So really the, the problem of control is one that I think will impede their usage in uh, mission critical uh, tasks. And uh, yeah, for us, we're mostly looking at the at text. So models like GPT-3, BERT, really to understand the documents uh, and act also as a pre-processing layer for uh, information extraction. In insurance, basically, we, our end product is contracts and all the documents associated with those contracts are so extracting uh, information from these contracts automatically that's a that's a big uh, brings a lot of business value and these models can help as a pre-processing step or as a pre-trained model on, on top of which we kind of uh, we fine-tune or we put other models thank you thank you luca really really good insights and perhaps uh Michal, you know i think uh, we we once discussed uh the impact of those models actually on the software engineering process which i think is fascinating feeling in itself. Uh, could you share your thoughts on that one? Yeah, uh, so um, GTP3 and, and OpenAI uh, uh, prove that uh, you can start using those mega models to generate functioning snippets on co of code. So uh, many of you probably have seen examples where you define what uh, what the function should uh, should do, what should produce, and in the end you get a functioning snippet of code. And I think this is, uh, although this is like a toy example, I think it's super promising for the future. And um, um, I can imagine, you know, a uh, couple lines, a uh, couple uh, couple years down the line, uh, we're gonna use uh, models like that to assist, you know, developers in the in this in this building process. And we also see some commercial examples of, of tools like that, for example, from Git, GitHub, a product called Copilot, where you can do exactly that, or from uh, Amazon AWS called Code Guru, another product which assists you with uh, finding bugs or security vulnerabilities. Um, so I, be, I believe that um, we are still in the moment where a lot of effort is spent um, disproportionately, disproportionately a big effort is spent on development versus on value creation. And maybe those models will help alleviate that. Very, very interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really fascinating. I think, honestly, we could spend probably a couple hours just talking about this, this trend. Uh, but I think we need to uh, move on because we have a few of them to, mm, to talk about. So let's move to, to the second one that, that we have here. So, um, you know, like classically training machine learning or AI models uh, has been done by feeding algorithms tons of labeled data. So if you want to train an algorithm to detect a cat, if there is a cat on the picture, you need to feed the neural net with millions of cat pictures, essentially. And this works very good for um, 
internet scale companies, but quite often in, especially in the enterprise context, we don't have that large amount of labeled data. So this has been a limiting factor for development of, of ML in, in enterprise. And currently we are quite excited to see that uh, we start seeing methods which are basically addressing this problem. And it looks like AI is getting a little bit less data hungry. So uh, perhaps, um, Michal, you know, could you, could you uh, give us a little bit of intuition about how those methods works and, and what they are about? Mm -hmm. So um, that, I think there are a couple uh, things we, that we need to talk about. One are the methods and uh, another one are tools that, that we start to see on the market. And um, so um, in terms of methods, there are, there are really various ones starting from um, self-supervision to, to semi-supervised semi models. But to give you intuition how, how, it, lo how, how it works is basically um, um, some models um, uh, help you in generating synthetic data, which then are used to train new models. Or there are other methods where you can use start using a structure, leverage structure of the data. For example, when the uh, when you have an image and you modify it slightly, uh, there there is high chance the resulting la label is the same. Yes, uh, so you can start uh, using that to to generate even more data to uh, to train those those models. Um, Another cool examples that we've seen in the past is, is from Google where um, engineers and researchers used only 250 labels uh, to, to generate state-of-the-art uh, classification model, whereas in the past you had to use thousands of thousands examples to build similar models. So it's quite promising uh, space. Yeah, cool, cool, Michal. Thanks, thanks for introducing the trend. And I, I'm super curious about the perspective from from the industry. Like Tanvi, in, in risk and compliance area, would you see those methods playing a role? Yeah, thank you, Marcin, and appreciate uh, the background, Michael. You've already provided on using more than non-supervised models. But before I answer your question, I have a strong feedback on what we call AI and what we shouldn't be calling AI when it comes to the industry. Because unlike the internet companies, especially in the financial industry, um, usually the models we build up are to help support and ease the decision-making power of the organization per se. And they don't operate in silo or we don't give them the authority to operate without any human intervention. So I would say ML is getting less data hungry and rephrase it on not uh, saying that AI is data hungry in the context of my experience uh, on this topic. So obviously the most obvious one where we feel over the years, non-supervised learning models, which are automatically more data efficient is playing a bigger role. Um, the domains that we operate in uh, within risk and compliance, you anyway have very uh, big dearth of finding the right data and the sensitivity of the data that we deal with, especially around KYC, around AML, it's hard to get access to a huge amount of data to improve the accuracy of your machine learning models. So non-supervised learning models obviously becomes the number one choice, but I agree with Michael also in our daily practice, we see a very good representation of synthetic data uh, that is used to training these models where you necessarily don't have to look for every client name and every client uh, metadata to, to work on uh, most of the compliance and risk related topics. So those two remain to be the key one that we have started to see becoming mainstream, but I'm also pretty excited also in the context of uh, the topic of data, of algorithms being data hungry is the concept of privacy and sense and the data sensitivity, not having, not being able to bring in data from different locations into one place. Otherwise you do have a corpus of data you could work with. Um, so the upcoming work the Open Mind uh, organization is doing with federated learning and making sure you don't have to bring the data in, for, in a data lake in first place, could also play a potential role where you don't have to aggregate or amass a huge amount of data onto a platform before you can do anything meaningful with that. Thank Great, you. thank you, Tanvi. So um, distinction between machine learning and AI, synthetic data, 
and federated learning this this is what i take uh, take out uh, really really great input thank you and um, I, I think luca you 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 have also some uh, interesting experience to share in in this space yeah thanks martin so first of all i would like to make the link to the mega models because as i previously mentioned some of these uh, mega models uh, they can be used as uh, pre-trained uh, models for other tasks and that uh, definitely reduces the amount of data that you need uh, in order to successfully learn models for these other tasks because you don't have to learn the, the, rep the data representation but so that was taken care of for you by these big companies that leverage a lot of data so basically these models learn the good representation for images or for text on top of which you can build your your model so you will need the less data so that's something that we're We'd be, we're using and we've been kind of exploring for, for quite a while, still in the tech space. Another approach that we're also uh, being uh, uh, leveraging is the active learning. So basically, in, instead of just accumulating large amounts of labeled data, uh, which may be so and so informative, we have an, an iterative process where we start with a small amount of labeled data and then we iteratively acquire new labels where the models are most uncertain so that we make best use of uh, the labeling efforts. Especially in our industry, uh, the labeling oftentimes comes from uh, experts and the time of experts uh, is quite valuable. We cannot ask them to just label 100 contracts or uh, 100 uh, submissions to understand the risk level. So, but using kind of active learning approaches, we can uh, you know, more handpick the document that they need to label that will bring more information to the models so that they can these models can learn with with, with less data uh, and these are i think some uh, practical examples that uh, i think everybody can uh, can explore that they, they don't cost much they don't require big infrastructure and uh, i think they produce some great results great great insights um, yeah i think it's it's nice that you made the link to the mega models that's true that all, those two are, are intertwined and interesting input on on active learning uh, I, I'm personally quite excited about this trend because I think it will really open up certain areas which so far have been kind of blocked uh, for for many, many of the industries. Yeah. And then moving on, you know, um, we have been talking quite a lot about uh, AI, the mega models, uh, machine learning. Uh, and I think those are enabling so many impactful business cases. This this is for sure. But I think one topic we, we shouldn't forget is that to enable those, you need to have a very strong infrastructure that allows you to store, govern, process um, all the data. Uh, and this space is also moving quite fast. Uh, we had several large trends in this space, um, you know, in, in the past decades. So if you look at uh, the 80s, we, we had first data warehouses, business intelligence uh, systems. Uh, then uh, in the years 2000, we had uh, on-prem data lakes. Then we had uh, cloud data lakes. So paradigms were shifting already several times and sort of a new buzzword on the block is, is the data mesh. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Valit, could you help us to, to, to understand uh, what data mesh is and is it perhaps important? It is definitely important. Um, I'm, you see me smiling because um, um, I'm in the data space for quite a while and I also had the pleasure to work on, a, on an introductory book for business intelligence and data warehousing. And actually the concepts themselves are not new. So we have them until the seventies and eighties. So it was called virtual data warehousing in the, at the time. And the, the, the essence was, let's say in a pure fashion, that you don't have to move data out of a transactional system. The only reason why we're moving data from an ERP system to a data warehouse, to a data lake, to a data lake house, your preference, whatever you want to have in there, is that the technology itself cannot, let's say, accommodate all means of usage that we put in. It's a different requirement that we have to have an asset transaction on a database than, for example, having a model trained on a storage of data. And that is the whole reason. It's technology. It's not because of concept. And we buy it to a certain degree with a lot of, um, let's say, technological complexity because we duplicate data, we transform data, which essentially means same data, similar format or different view with a different storage. We have a lot of issues with the data lineage and and and. So for me, the data mesh is, is obviously something that is happening, but it's also still in formation. 
And the essence of it is essentially, at least we can, most data practitioners can agree that um, the enterprise data warehouse, the one single source of two is the one place where you find the right data, the one ring to rule them all, it's not gonna happen. And therefore, essentially the, 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 the current tendency is, okay, but at least we can connect several hubs where we have some kind of, um, at least it's close enough, at least for one domain, for example, and then integrate those. And ideally push down compute to the data and not always move the data to the compute. So when you look, let's say first generation data science teams, how they work, they try to download everything on the computer and then they run the models locally. And then the computer is too slow. Actually, I had one colleague who then ordered six laptops and connected them so that he could have enough <laughs> compute. So that was the first generation, okay? And what, what then happened was the cloud and everybody pushed uh, their, uh, their workloads into the cloud and then they got the bill and then everybody was like, oh my God, this is way too expensive. We got to go back to the HPC cluster and so on. So long story short, for me, the mesh is essentially an intelligent management balancing of data, data storage with a minimum of duplication, only as much as possible. And also therefore less management overhead for moving data and making data understandable and actionable. And on the other side, an intelligent balancing of pushing the compute that we need to train models, but also to execute models to, to where the data is residing. And in an, let's say ultimate instance, this could be also on the edge. Take for example, Mercedes-Benz, my previous employer, um, they have enough computing power, like six MacBooks. So there is a lot of power in there, but it's not leverage for anything, at least not in the previous generations in the future that will change. But this is not used for inference. This is not used for training. This is not used for analysis. This is just used for transaction controlling essentially the system. So for me, the mesh is immensely powerful and it's still unfortunately baby steps that we're making, but it's definitely the right direction. And it's something I am very excited about and I'm having a very keen eye on. Super excellent insights, uh, Valid. What I'm taking out of uh, what you just said, if, if you think so. Uh, I like uh, the fact that you mentioned that those concepts are not necessarily uh, something we invented uh, last couple of months ago, but they might be coming from uh, 70s and 80s. That's, that's very interesting. Uh, I like the fact that you say it's happening, that you believe in it, but also that uh, we are making baby steps. And that's, I think, also a little bit how, how we see things. Uh, and I really liked what you said about um, yeah, this kind of central infrastructure mm, to rule them all uh, not happening. I, I've been smiling because I think everybody who tried to build one probably, uh, mm, yeah, probably feels feels what you mean. Um, great. And I, I would be also curious, mm, perhaps, Michal, from, from your perspective, because you're working with a number of, of large, large customers. Like, if you look at this trend of, of data mesh, what, what are the pros and cons? Like, is it for everybody? Is it only for some organizations? Well, what are the trade-offs? Um, so, um, in terms of, um, so, so I, I think this this uh, this trend is uh, is still still very young. Yes, we uh, uh, there, there are new tools popping up, but that are not fully addressing entire problem. Um, you have to ask yourself questions like, uh, okay, if I have um, um, several systems uh, belonging to data domains, how I gonna control how this data moves? Yes. So how you ensure security and compliance? How you gonna track lineage? And I um, I think the, um, these topics are still evolving. We don't have a full answer yet. Um, so. Um, I believe in coming years we're gonna we're gonna uh, experience uh, probably several players um, providing answers to that and uh, and standards emerge. Um, so as a young company, you have to answer your questions: Am I ready to uh, or am I ready to adopt this kind of uh, technology? Yes, and uh, is my key, is team skilled uh, in sufficient manner to? Uh, to introduce this this tech. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Michal. And I think, uh, Luca, you, you might have a different perspective on, uh, on the topic. Well, 
more than a different perspective, maybe it's a complementary perspective because uh, one of there's the the technology layer of a data mesh that is trying to resolve uh, kind of computation, but then there's also the aspect of uh, data quality, you know, kind of keeping the the data close to its origin, close to its uh, context, and this for me more than a technological aspect, it's more of a cultural governance aspect that you can implement uh, using a data lake or data warehouse. Basically, who is owner of the business application or the process that generates this data should really view the data as a product. So kind of having this, these people really yeah, thinking about what they produce in terms of data as a product that they provide to the rest of organization. And then that mentality will uh, ensure that this data is of high quality, that is uh, inter interoperable. So I think there is this two distinct layers of the technology that can help certain organizations or not, but definitely the cultural aspect uh, can help uh, any organization to really have clear data ownership for uh, ensuring data quality and data data exchange. Super, Th thank you. Um, okay, so I think we can move on to, to the next trend, which is a little bit related. So we are staying in this space of enabling machine learning, enabling analytics. Um, so, you know, like a few years ago, if you look at it, um, many machine learning models were often in this R&D kind of space. So this meant that people uh, were building the models and, and uh, using them on their local machines. And quite often they were not used for uh, productive reasons. And since quite recently, more and more companies start using those models for driving important business decisions. So we see models taking actions worth millions of dollars uh, every day. And this is why I think we need to professionalize all this space to ensure reliability, reproducibility, overall stability of these ML enabled systems. And this is exactly what uh, ML ops tries to enable. So perhaps um, Luca, if you could, uh, Tell us a little bit about what MLOps is and, and how you see it applied in, in your context. Well, again, for me, also from M MLOps, there is a, a technological component and a cultural component. The technological component is, uh, is quite mature at this point. I think we, we saw great progress in the recent years in providing platforms for uh, the end-to-end -end management of, uh, of a machine learning project lifecycle from uh, versioning data, versioning code, versioning models, deploying and monitoring models. So this really enables uh, the kind of yeah, the end-to-end -end life cycle of machine learning with the, uh, without having to have uh, kind of handovers to different teams without being lost in translation when uh, you know a data science team gives codes to a, a soft engineering team to deploy these models into into applications and, and so on. So this uh, is definitely very mature and allows uh, to become more efficient in, uh, in creating models, in auditing models, in monitoring them. But this also kind of creates a, a bit of a cultural change where uh, we go, we basically we break the silos between uh, data engineers, uh, machine learning engineers, data scientists, and software engineers. And basically this is really ties nicely with the also agile uh, transformation where you have a a team that really follows the entire life cycle of the projects end to end. So I think, in, especially in the recent years, there's been a development in both agile mindsets and the MLOps uh, tech stack in companies. And we start seeing, uh, especially not in tech companies, which uh, have probably jumped on the train uh, much earlier, but uh, especially in financial industry, uh, starting to see uh, considerable gains by adopting this at scale. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, very interesting aspect that you brought up. So cultural and tech aspect. Uh, I'm curious about your take on this, Stanley. Uh, how do you see uh, MLOps in, in your context? I very much agree with what Luca just said, right? For, um, for the longest time, the organizations in the financial industry have been getting their act together on DevOps. And in the last couple of years, you see that also coming to life in the space of um, ML on what we are trying to do to make more robust set of applications in, in, in the data space. Now, this is also taking its own time where um, 
people in the data science or uh, people coming in from the data engineering background trying to find answers to uh, to to a, to a lot of questions that data can answer rather than just focusing on the front end and uh, creating more CRM kind of applications. It was a good to have. And in the last few years, you start to see a lot of that effort in the ML space is a must have. And when you get into the must have space, you want to create solutions which are more robust, which are more resilient, which are more audit proof, which could be provided as, as an ongoing sort of machinery uh, towards your stakeholders and a major set of risk management decision making are based on that. And in that context, MLOps becomes not an optional, but a must do. Um, and different organizations are, uh, diff are, are in different spaces on their journeys towards MLOps. I feel in our, in our world on compliance, this is the number one priority that we are focusing on and how to create solutions that are resilient, that are uh, foolproof and are continuously keep producing the results that they're expected to. So your data pipelines aren't breaking, you're optimized, you're orchestrating your data sets very well, and it shouldn't be uh, the first time it worked, but for the next few times, we don't know. So how do you also create a proper monitoring around that? And, and making sure that it doesn't become a departmental topic, it becomes an organizational topic, just the way DevOps are. So we, we are the second child in the process from a DevOps to an MLOps state, but I think it's, 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 a, it's not a future trend, it's the present trend. It is something we all have to do in order to make sure that you're deriving the value from all the investment and all the right people in that space to an organization. I'm moving away from a sandbox to a more productive environment. Great, great insights. I'm, I'm taking out of it a few things. So I, I like very much, uh, we are moving from nice to have to must have. That's, that's I think, uh, also what we observe. And it's not a future trend, it's, it's today's trend. That's, that's really great to, uh, great to hear. And perhaps uh, to wrap it up, uh, Julian, from your perspective, if, if you again would, would maybe summarize a little bit the benefits, right? Because we talked a lot about the technology, about the cultural aspects, uh, but in the end, from business perspective, well, what are we getting out of, out of uh, applying MLOps? Mm -hmm. I think uh, at the core, uh, it's really about, um, you know, impact of uh, basically taking the machine learning models out of notebooks uh, to the wild and really sort of deploy them the way we used to deploy software um, previously, right? Um, and it's also about, to a large extent, I think, empowering the data scientists as well, right? Because um, for me, the science in data science is really also about, you know, having a kind of uh, reproducible way to obtain results and make experiments and validate uh, or falsify hypotheses and for this you need you know a good framework and i really agree with what was said that this is more about uh, culture and mindset than about really exactly the technology we have lots of good technologies for doing mlops already today um, but it's yeah it's, it's really a mindset uh, change that is happening um valid i think you have something to add <laughs> yeah just a small thing because i i, I can only uh, agree 100 percent to everything that was said just maybe a little a little spin on on why we're doing that so i agree with everything the, this is a question of maturity this is something that we definitely need for an industrialized professional delivery of machine learning and ai but why and for me, the why is always the user, the customer, the decision maker that we have there. Building, building in quality control, professional handling into our models to make sure that they are responsible, that they are fair, that they are fit to purpose, builds trust in the system. Explainability is very important to that. And only if people understand and trust models, then they will incorporate them in their daily doing, in their processes, in their work, in the business. And therefore, for me, MLOps is so important. It's not to make only to make data scientists and software engineers' lives better and easier, but that we really can generate the business impact and value that we need to do. Because this, for me, is the prerequisite to be at, let's say, that we can deliver something where somebody in the business looks at and says, yes, I understand that, I trust that, I act on that, and then we see the positive outcome out of it. Therefore, it might just be sound a bit technical, ML ops, but I believe it's the key to a lot of business value and business impact that we can generate. Great input. One keyword, trust. 
Um, great. So we have still a couple minutes uh, left. And what I would like to do now is to uh, ask our panelists to spend really one, two minutes each uh, talking about other trends that they see for the years to come uh, that are on the horizon uh, and share with us what you think is hot and will be hot in, in advanced analytics space. So perhaps uh, let's start with you, Tanvi. What, what are your bets? So the background that I come from, uh, it's, it's uh, not going to be a surprise when I would say it's privacy. <laughs> uh, how do you create privacy pre preserving solutions in the AI ML space is, is a trend which is not new. It's not something that you more forward looking. It's more what's happening today, but we see that getting absorbed, getting implemented, uh, taking a BAU format in the next few years. And uh, in, in, even within my space, that's an area that I am spending a lot of time learning and understanding what can you really do for the organization that you don't have to spend 80% of your time getting the need to know, getting the legal approvals towards the data. And you have a privacy, privacy preserving application that absolutely take care of uh, the data privacy, but at the same time gives value out of your algorithms. So that would be the key trend that I would be looking after in the next few years. Great. Thank you, Tanvi. Um, how about you, Valid? So if I have to pick one, actually it would not be so much an advanced analytics, but more a data piece, which is foundational to the advanced analytics, and I believe it's data economies. So what we see more and more, and we had this when we had the, um, that models become less and less data hungry. I believe um, there is still a large appetite to have more data available. So, so I, I don't believe too much into, let's say, simple data monetization in terms of here's my data, give me money. But I essentially believe that more and more supply chains, um, for example, need to integrate and exchange data on production processes. We've just launched a collaboration with Palantir yesterday called Athenia, for example, for the semiconductor industry. Sorry for the advertisement. Um, but in, in essence, we see this again and again. Nobody in any industry has ever enough data. And I believe there will be some kind of economy in terms of here's my data and what I want back in exchange is also data or insights, something like that. Might not be a thing, but that's at least something that's on my mind. Uh, very, very, very interesting. And and Luca, what what what, what would you place your bets on? I mean, privacy and data economy are very good trends. We we see them also in in our industry. Uh, both of them very, very, very big. I would add uh, along the lines of what Valid mentioned before about building trust, uh, transparency, and the building transparency into non-simple models because oftentimes we have requirements for transparency and then we go back to build linear models but we could have done this kind of 40 years ago right so now that we have all these technologies deep learning and uh, uh, and so on uh, how do we explain those models to an audience which is not technically savvy to build uh, to build and buy their trust and here i see that there are still uh, some good uh, recent developments that we that we're exploring Shapley values uh, counterfactuals, but uh, uh, I think we're still not there yet. Especially for more complex models like NLP or, or computer vision, we need to still experiment and find uh, techniques uh, that will allow us to really to explain these models uh, to a wider audience. So this is something that we'll really will be working on intensively next year, and we'll keep monitoring. Excellent. Thank you, Luca. Uh, yeah, we are slowly running out of time. So very quickly, one trend, Julian, and then Michal. Okay, if I had to keep only one in addition to, you know, what was said. Uh, personally, I'm very excited about uh, sort of nascent applications of machine learning to optimization problems. So I think machine learning is about much more than just, you know, predictions. Uh, but we can do optimization with it. And I'm super excited when I think of what's coming, just to give an example about uh, drug design, for example. Great. And Michal? Um, another one maybe that was not mentioned is uh, uh, pushing, um, pushing some of those capabilities uh, to the edge, to, to environments where AI was... Not, not not visible before, for example, 
retrofitting some old manufacturing devices and equip equipping them with with AI capabilities. Uh, in marketing terms, it's called uh, uh, edge uh, pushing cloud to the edge. Um, but we've seen many examples where um, you know those big cloud providers really uh, producing useful SDKs and devices which can be installed in those areas. Uh, um, where that were not covered before uh, for IoT, uh, manufacturing, etc. Excellent, super. Thank you very much. We are on top of the hour. Mm, I honestly enjoyed tremendously this, this discussion. Uh, again, I think we could spend uh, hours and hours talking about those topics. Um, yeah, please join me in thanking the panel. Thank you so much, um, Tanvi, Luca. Valid, uh, Julian, Michal for being today with us. Uh, yeah, the content will be available online and uh, we will probably make, uh, make also a small summary for, for those of you uh, who, who are interested. Billy, Mike goes back to you. Yes. Thank you everyone. As uh, Martin said, it was a really engaging topic and uh, all the insights were really reach for the audience. We had a few comments. Unfortunately, we couldn't answer today, but hopefully we'll do soon as, uh, as much said, producing more like a bigger report that we'll send to you. So contact us if you want to receive it. In the same time, I thank you again, everyone for joining us, the speakers, Wally, Luca, Tanvi, uh, Michal, Julian, and of course, Martin for the moderation. You can watch uh, all the episodes on our YouTube channel. It's uh, unit talks number 17, so we have few other content that you can watch. On the January 19, we're going to talk about data-driven uh, manufacturing optimization. So follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram to get updated. That's uh, all for today. Thank you. It was unit talks, and we wish you a wonderful day. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.